Welcome. Uh, my name is Margie Welspin and I have been the Warden of Whitley College for the last 12 years. We are about to begin our celebration and it would be appreciated if you would turn off mobile phones. I hope I've remembered to turn mine off. <laughs> Thank you to Jack Tan for that very pleasant music as we gathered. I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which our college is situated. I pay respect to elders both past and present of the Wurundjeri nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who are present. It is with mixed feelings that I welcome residents, alumni, families and friends to Whitley College. We are pleased so many could make it um, and some will be coming later in the day. We have representatives from every decade of the college's existence here in Parkville. The Prime Minister of Australia, Sir Robert Menzies, opened Whitley College on this site in February 1965. In a grand and moving ceremony, he exhorted people to never let anybody persuade you that you have made an error by creating a university college, which he predicted would contribute so much to the life of the nation. I wonder what he would now think about the closing of this very special university college. It is important to acknowledge Mervyn Himbury, who founded the college and was principal from 1959 to 1986, a stupendous effort. It was his vision and dedication to create a university residential college closely linked to the new theological school. Of course, he was ably supported by many fabulous people. We acknowledge his son, Milo, who is here today. I'd like to introduce you to the people involved in this service. Reverend Andrew Woff, former resident of Whitley. Reverend Dr. Ken Manley, principal of the college from 1987 to 2000. Jack Tan, Dean of Studies, and Caleb Ballinger, former resident. And now I'll hand over to Andrew Woff. Thank you very much, Margie, and good morning to everyone. I arrived at Whitley in 1977 to study commerce. It's my first step away from home and from a fairly sheltered family in a country town. For four years, this place became my transitional home. And I reckon every day I live, I do so in part as a result of the gift of the community of this place. Today is such a day of mixed feelings for us. It feels half reunion and half funeral. It's like we're both here for a big party and attending a memorial service at the same time. So the purpose of this service is simply to offer all of us a bit of safe and gentle space to be true to whatever is happening for us, both individually and together. It offers us an opportunity to recognise our own unique journeys and feelings and experiences of this place, while also providing a communal space for us to acknowledge what is happening today and to share it together. It's a time to hold all that our life in this place has meant to us. So today will be about remembering and sharing stories, lots of stories, expressing our gratitude for the way this residential community has shaped our lives and been a gift to us. Acknowledging our grief and lament as something that feels part of us, is lost to us and opening ourselves to hope for all the promise of the future that comes out of the investment of this place. In preparation for this service, um, Ken Manley, who will speak to us a little bit later, suggested that Psalm 84 from the Bible could be a relevant focus for reflection. It's a moving piece of writing about the sense of safety and belonging and joy experienced by pilgrims when they came to the temple. So with apologies to the psalmist, 
it struck me that its sentiments could be tweaked a lot <laughs> to talk about the way this residential college became a formative home away from home for so many of us. So I thought I'd have a play. Today we look around us and we see the familiar landscapes and architecture. Corridors, rooms and doors. And in a heartbeat, we remember countless moments, stories, faces, people. How precious is this place in our remembering? How important in the trajectory of our lives? For a moment, it's like we fall back in time. We are back in those days again. And we feel pangs of longing and gratitude and sadness. We came here long before there were careers, achievements, houses or partners. Our journeys of adulthood just at their beginning. Tentative, insignificant, insecure. And here we found a foothold, a place of safe lodging, belonging, friendship, support, parties, trike races, college sports, drama, the odd crazy risk or two. We shared our struggles and tears, our learning and laughter. Here, our place. Whitley. We come from all over the place, the country, overseas, the suburbs. Sometimes some of us joined the Friday night pilgrimage home. But whether our journeys took us by car or train, on Sunday night we'd return here. Cardboard roast unfailingly on the menu. <laughs> and we studied and we learnt and we grew. We learnt about ourselves, our capacities, our limitations, our needs, our struggles, our dreams, our fears, our vocation, and we were launched into adulthood. From here, our first home away from home, our protective shield, sometimes our place of excruciating difficult adjustment, often our place of deep delight. Today we look back at what once was and all that has happened since and we say, God, for all that has been, thanks. We continue our reflections in a piece of music that was composed by someone from this Whitley community to reflect home on Royal Parade. Uh, Ray is going to come and introduce it to us. Thank you. Okay, so I wrote this piece in 2014, at which point I was doing my undergrad in music, studying composition. Uh, I'm now doing my master's in audiology, so it's been a bit of a shift. But yeah, this piece was written right after it was announced that Whitley might potentially be closing. Um, so it is essentially kind of my own personal reflection on the situation at the time, I suppose. And we, on the night it was announced, a bunch of ex resis had come by and we were all just uh, hanging out in the junior common room. And one particular ex resi Amy Clements, who was a flute player, was there, and another resident, Liesl. Um, and I just said to them, I have a concert that I need to write a piece for in two weeks. Uh, if I wrote something in one week, could we rehearse it and play that? And then this came about. All right, I'll, we'll perform it now.
So today's Bible reading comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 to 17. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid. That foundation is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. If the work is burned up, the builder will suffer loss. The builder will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. Like many of you, I'm having such a mixture of emotions today. I wouldn't begin to try and count the number of times, for example, that I've been in this chapel. <laughs> Though when I first came here, it was a little different. The pulpit was much higher. <laughs> we didn't have a grand piano. Though we did have the three wise men and the organ, both of them incidentally significant gifts to this college. We often speak and think of life as a journey, a struggle, an exercise in both gain and loss, joy and sorrow. No life consists of nothing but success and satisfaction, of security and self-gratification. Failure and disappointment, loss and pain are natural and inevitable parts of the human equation. So we have gathered here today to celebrate and remember what Whitley has given to so many of us. In words, in music, I was trying to detect the noise of the trams in your composition, but couldn't, <laughs> couldn't quite get them. <laughs> living on Royal Parade. <laughs> we have shared so much, so many of us. And at such junctures, I often remind myself of the wise words which have become something of a life motto for me these last years. Effectively a prayer of a distinguished leader, United Nations, Dag Hammarskjöld, who said, as Andrew's already quoted to us, for all that has been Thanks. But he went on to say, for all that will be, yes. That's my emotion today. <laughs> Gratitude is a choice. A choice we're often invited to embrace. But it's demanding to be asked to say, for all that has been. Of course, much easily prompts gratitude. But there are other experiences, perhaps painful and sad. And yet, in retrospect, the mature experiences to say, for all that has been, for all that has made us, shaped us, thanks. And I wonder what might feature we've already had some suggestions, in our gratitude for Whitley today. Your very presence here, of course, suggests that you do have personal memories and experiences that I hope prompt gratitude. Perhaps personal friendships. I've not done the sums, but I wonder how many marriages have come out of Whitley community life. <laughs> 
growth in learning and character, at least in part, shaped by being here at Whitley. Simply having a good time. The process of growing into maturity. Yes, some of you are still here and I must say as the years go by, students, first year students always look so much younger. <laughs> I've even got grandchildren who are students these days. <laughs> but beyond such personal reasons for gratitude, we have some common memories, don't we? This place, this site, these buildings. I want to remind you that they are here because of the great vision of our pioneers. They are witnesses to a very powerful faith and to the remarkable generosity of very many people. After more than 50 years on this site, can we rehearse together mentally or perhaps even as we talk some of the reasons for our common gratitude for all that has been now, this is not the time and place to rehearse the history of the college in any detail. Though, as already Margie has said, there are some names, some events we should name. Most of you will know that the college began as a theological college in 1891 with a handful of students. And the first principal was a young scholar from England William Thomas Whitley came out here and his wife died shortly after he came here though happily he found another wife before he went back to England but Whitley was the founding principal and across the next 60 years that was the purpose of this college set up by the Baptist churches of Victoria from 1912 it occupied premises in 1912 I think today is it still a motel over there in North Melbourne. <laughs> but a new principal came from Wales in 1959 and he was an impressive presence in every way. Mervyn Himbury. And he came with the first really one to grasp a new vision for the college. A college that would be formally linked with the University of Melbourne it would be a university college, perhaps thinking of colleges he'd known back in Britain, but even more so perhaps other colleges around the Crescent. A vision where theologues and secular students, as Mervyn used to always call them, <laughs> would live and learn together. And as it turned out, the times were right for such a vision. The vision took concrete shape. But I want to remind you that it only happened because of the faith and the generosity of many very ordinary people from the Baptist churches and other interested friends here in Victoria. Let's pause and give thanks for people like John Hopkins, who gave practical drive to this project, worked himself into the ground that this place might be built. People like Jeff Stevens and Bernard Moore and Tom Keat and Milton Warren and I hope you've still got college, college histories available, you can read about them all. <laughs> they were the pioneers. Yes, there were some timely bequests which assured the pioneers that God was leading them and fundamentally aided the building of the college and there was a new government policy of advancing university education which helped fund this new college. The times were right, yes. But the initial impetus came from very many ordinary people who put their hands into the pockets and said, yes, we think the Baptist churches should have a university college as well as the schools that we have. For all those people, <laughs> we give thanks. So on that very exciting day that's already been alluded to, the famous donut was opened. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Australia, who could match Mervyn in girth 
and perhaps in eloquence. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Australia stood up on the balcony out there. And the crowds were all out there on the 25th of February 1965. And for the first time, the name Whitley College was pronounced. Some of you were there that day, weren't you? Here's a few. Milo. Where's Milo? I saw him before. I know he was there because in the official photo he's there. <laughs> Along with Menzies and his family, and there he is, a schoolboy, grinning away at the beginning of Whitley College. Great that he's here today. And as Margaret also said, the Prime Minister said, never let anyone tell you that it was wrong to build a university college. So, there it is. No one is saying today that the creation of Whitley was an error. No one. On the contrary. How many thousands, as it would be, I guess, of students have made Whitley their home? How many residents and visiting tutors have patiently helped students to gain the most from their studies, even as they themselves were completing their advanced studies? We can celebrate significant academic, academic achievements. It would be an embarrassment to name some. But Whitley played a role in the development of many of these. We recall student leaders who worked hard to arrange for a fulfilling community life, SCR presidents and all the rest of them. Formal dinners and debates and sport and drama and musical performances, common room dances, <laughs> says a weary principal. <laughs> <laughs> College balls, Christian fellowship, innumerable informal activities, they're the kind of, in, those informal things, the things we think about mostly when we think of our days in college, aren't they? The time we did something really was a bit immature, but it was great fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know what fills your mind, perhaps things like that, for all that has been. <laughs> Thank, thanks. Yes, no one can doubt that Mervyn Hembury gave an extraordinary lead. 27 years he was principal here. What an extraordinary achievement. He wore large shoes to try and fill when I came here in 1987. After almost 100 years of the college's life, I was only the fifth principal. And of course only the second as principal of Whitley as a university college. I must be honest and admit that when I started here, I scarcely knew what I had let myself in for. <laughs> Noisy common room dancers were the least of my problems. <laughs> I'd been at an Oxford College as Mervyn had been at an Oxford College. But most of my experience had been in theological colleges. I don't want you to think the theological colleges are places where silly things never happen, quite the contrary. But that aspect of Whitley's life here at that time created one or two difficulties for me, coming down from, you know, sober Sydney to riots as Whitley. <laughs> not, not quite. <laughs> but the time I came also was the time when the theological side of the college really boomed. We had over 300-something, perhaps 400 students as well as the wonderful community of, what, 150 or whatever it was here. And I knew I couldn't do what Mervyn had done and keep all those balls in the air at the same time. I needed help. And so I asked for assistance and it was readily given. And so I want to acknowledge that in my time and I suspect in subsequent principals' times, the leadership of the University College was largely delegated from the principal. I honour those who've given significant leadership whether we call them deans or wardens or whatever. Ian Roos, now Ian Roos had himself been a university student in that pioneer group in 1965 and he was a wonderful dean. 
and did, as far as I was concerned, a magnificent. How many of you were students in Ian's time? Some of you certainly. And then, uh, I hope I've remembered everybody, prompt me if I forget, was it Loretta Reynolds who was there, an American, remember some of you knew Loretta, Phil Mosley, and since my time, Brenda Holt and Margie, have I left anybody out? Margie, I hope not. And the fine teams that they had to develop with them. For all these, we give thanks. Now the Bible reading in 1 Corinthians was not just because I'm normally a preacher as well as a principal, but it reminded me of something I believe that is quite important for us to think about today. Now, the Apostle Paul was, as you know, thinking about the church and the building up of those small Christian communities. But the principle is the same, and it may be applied to a community like Whitley. That foundations are important, said the Apostle. You need a good foundation if you're going to have a good building. And he said, one prepares, another builds on it. But eventually, what has been built will be judged in one way or another. So we might ask ourselves, how well? I'm not so much thinking of the donut buildings, but of the community. How well was the foundation laid? What quality materials were brought to build it up across the ensuing 50 years? I'm not suggesting this is a day of judgment. I'm saying we're offered a timely opportunity to give thanks for all those who built a good place here at Whitley. I don't understand all the reasons for the decision that has brought us together today. As a former principal, I obviously care deeply, but it has not been my role as a retired person to have any involvement in the complex issues that have faced our college's leadership. I acknowledge that these are difficult days for educators. I acknowledge that the challenges to provide the best possible facilities that are needed today are incredibly demanding. I understand all of that. But here we are, the decision's been taken, and the crucial thing is what we do with our memories, with our hopes. Yes, we look back, I hope, in giving thanks. For many of us, it would want to give thanks to God, not just in the abstract giving thanks, but specifically to God, and beyond God, to all those who've influenced us. You might mentally think of a few who've helped you believe, shaped your life, your career. Perhaps what we can all do today, as we reflect on these 50 years, or it may be even just the last year or so for some of you, it is to acknowledge that what has been built here is a very significant community and all that has been done here is to be celebrated. There were hard times. I think of student deaths and other sad events. But altogether, I believe, I hope, you can join with me and say there were good foundations, quality materials, were built into this place, and that's Whitley. It has a new principal sitting quietly at the back <laughs> who comes from another country. He will be responsible for the theological college, but is here today, I'm sure, to express his support for all that the place has been in the past. Can you join me? For all that has been at Whitley, let us hear us. Thanks, once again, <laughs> for all that has been at Whitley. Thanks. I hope, too, we can find hope as we face our individual futures for what will be. Yes.
Thank you so much, Ken, for leading and stirring our own personal reflections. Of course, some of the headlines of the all that has been have been named from the front. But a lot of the really important stuff of the all that has been are carried in our own memories and our own hearts. And that's where we want to turn the focus now for a few minutes. On the way in, I think everybody would have received in their program, in their order of service, two pieces of card. A red one shaped as a heart and a blue one shaped as a teardrop. I'd like to invite you to spend a few moments to bring to mind what you have treasured most about your time here at Whitley. What Whitley contributed to your life what today you find yourself holding most dear in your heart. And then using your own pen or one of the pens that's being passed around, I'd like you to write that or draw it on your heart. Then I'd love you to get in touch with any sense of sadness that you carry with you today. It may be that you are in touch with something that happened while you were here that you still grieve. Or it may simply be a sense of sorrow that this place that's held so much for you is now coming to a close. Once you've got that, write or draw it on your teardrop. So, the heart for something you treasure and value about Whitley, the teardrop for something you grieve. We're going to give you a few minutes to do that. And while we're doing that, there'll be some musical accompaniment. And I'd like you just to see this as your own quiet, open, safe place to make links between coming here today, remembering the people and the places, listening to Ken. Okay, what is it that I am holding? Pop that down on your heart or on your teardrop, and then when you're ready, just bring it forward and place it in the relevant basket. I think you'll be able to work out which one is which. You've got a few minutes, so relax. This is your time to do the work of getting in touch with what it is that you are holding in these moments today. Thank you.
which we will be presenting to family members after the service and during the afternoon. Firstly, Sam Cramp, who studied engineering and science at the University of Melbourne in 2007. Sam made friends easily and touched many lives at Whitley. His father, Peter, and mother, Annie, met at Whitley when they were residents in the late 70s. We welcome Annie and Sam's sister, Sally, who are here today. Catherine Lake from Bendigo studied science, majoring in IT, and lived at Whitley in 1998 and 1999. Kath was much loved for her vivacity and enthusiasm. Her parents, Rosalie and Ron, were unable to be here today due to a prior commitment. James Rapley moved from Seymour in 2003 to study engineering and science. James was a high achiever, talented basketballer and loyal friend. He was the Whitley Student Club president in 2005. His parents, uh, John and Judy and siblings, Julia and David, generously set up a scholarship for rural students coming to live at Whitley. And that scholarship will continue on at the university. John will be here later this afternoon. John Hopkins, as already mentioned, was first president of the college and a driving force behind the building of the residential college and instrumental in raising funds for the building. We welcome John's son, David, and granddaughter, Sarah, who are both residents and are here today. Rituals of gratitude and of sorrow and ending interweave our day to day. We've shared in a couple of simple rituals of ending. I wonder if we can now offer to one another some simple expressions of our own gratitude. They may reflect the things that you've already written down on your heart or some other thing for which you'd like to express your thankfulness. You'd recognise that this is not the time for lengthy speeches and long anecdotes, but we would like to invite some simple, heartfelt expressions that begin, I am grateful for. Uh, they would be very appropriate in adding to the richness of what we are doing. We've got just a few minutes in which to do that and a couple of roving microphones. He's going to grab the roving microphones and assist their passage around us. A couple of people who might be happy to do that. And I'm wondering who'd like to get us started. We've got, we've got three or four minutes. So if anybody would like just to express something of their gratitude for what this place has meant, that would be terrific. Thank you. So it's always gutsy to go first. You can go to the front of the lunch queue. Well done. Someone else. Thank you. Perhaps you person number three coming up, Heather. <coughs> Chris and I represent an era that's a little bit further afield than Anne is. Um, I'm very grateful that I can say in 43 years since coming to first coming to Whitley and then through in that initial life of only that I have met my husband, I am sitting surrounded by a number of friends that I still correspond with and that I feel 
I hope that's just the beginning of some of the sharing and gratitude we will be offering one another through the rest of the program. I might just be reflecting my own era, but I can't finish this service without mentioning pondings. <laughs> and who remembers the Hicks test? not so familiar to some of you. It had to do with frozen, long prepared frozen desserts that acted like glue, such that they could be turned upside down and the plate moved the whole length of the dining hall during hall. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> and and mentioning Mervyn, mentioning Mervyn, I, I have permanently in my head this little tape that goes like this. For these and all his blessings, may God's holy name be praised. Amen. I remember that from every hall, except when he went Latin on us. Um, it's natural that all our experience of Whitley as a residential college is attached to this place. And there is for us today a sense that the closure of the residential college brings with it for us a personal loss. But along with Ken's reflection, I want to conclude with the thought that that which actually nurtures and nourishes our memories about all that was precious to us is us. It's not so much the buildings and this location, but our awareness and our relationships that keep this rich history alive. Our Whitley experience and all the formation that happened here lives on in us every day. All the goodness we received here is expressed in our living and our working and our loving and our serving every day. 
Do you know, through the echoes of time, I have a resilient memory of my final valedictory dinner here at Whitley, at which one of the students, and I don't remember who, contributed a witty poem, which ended with the sentiment that however our life might work out and wherever we might go, remember that Whitley was a part of your life. It sure was. So let me say on behalf of us all, Whitley Residential College, today we bid you farewell and we thank you and we release ourselves from you. We celebrate today the countless gifts invested in our lives here. We recognise those who contributed so much, principals, office, cleaning and kitchen staff, deans, tutors, wardens, deputy wardens, chaplains, residents, friends. <laughs>